What's up, boys? We're back. Burger Bros. Podcast, episode three. How are you guys doing? Just living the dream. Yeah, uh, doing great. A little rainstorm been... last night, but sun's out. SoCal, Lucky. so that's good. No it's... rain in LA, though. We're, uh, it's we're pouring good. up here. But yeah, we were a little worried. We planted a pretty uh, extensive garden out in the backyard. And so we're kind of tripping with this rain. We're hoping that the flowers don't just keel over from too much water but um so far so good yeah that's great so you've well, been doing a you've been doing a big garden up in Santa Cruz. yeah right? we have a pretty major little uh operation going we have uh let's see one two three four five six seven garden beds hmm. two eight by threes one six by two and then some pretty janky DIY type boxes that we just built uh, last year. Um, we got dahlias, zinnias. Um, we got, uh, what are they called? Pink cushions. We got uh, daffodils. Um, I'm Here's forgetting all the names. What's that? You're just a big flower guy now. I mean, yeah, pretty much. Gardening so fun. It's like just really therapeutic. I've, and the, I think my favorite part is like starting it from like a little tiny seed that you harvested from a plant and then watching it grow into a little seedling and then putting it in the ground and then having it grow and then turn into uh, like an actual like beautiful flower or, uh, you know, doing the same thing with veggies. I was doing last year, I did a ton of veggies, getting carrots and tomatoes. And I mean, we go to the grocery store and we spend all this money on vegetables. And if you have a backyard, you literally could grow all your vegetables that you buy at the grocery store yeah. for yeah. a fraction of the cost, you know, in the long term. Obviously, it's kind of a bit of an upfront cost if you're building garden beds and, you know, have to buy, you know, tubers or bulbs or whatever. But in the long run, um, it is really it's it's actually really therapeutic, I find. That's cool. Like just Similar just the other day, it was like super hot and baking in the backyard. You just go out there and pull up a chair and just sit in the garden. It's peaceful. There's birds and little, you know, insects and butterflies all flying around. Um, after a long day of working or like, you know, long morning, going outside and just sitting in the garden to just like clear your head or relax. It's just it's kind of what's needed, especially in the type of work that we all do. Well, it's similar to how these businesses we created start, <laughs> you know, you got this little idea and you plant it in some soil and, you know, you got to invest some capital to get all the little things you need, the SaaS stuff and the, you know, set up your, you know, LLC and go and, you know, put some capital in it and then just roll up your sleeves and, you know, start just nurturing this little seedling and then uh, ideally it grows into a, a plant and then you know grows into a business and then ideally you know starts producing fruit <laughs> that yeah. can feed your family <laughs> your labor yeah it's a great analogy and I, it's actually a good analogy for anybody who's interested in starting a business if you actually bring that analogy of gardening to your business, then it will give you good context on, you know, what you need to do, even though you don't really necessarily have all the information um, to know exactly what to do. Like there's some instinct that kind of comes with it. And it's interesting because it's the same context. Like if you have a kid, you know, it's not like you read every book on childbearing and you know how to be a great father or a great mother but there's a lot of instinct that comes with it uh, from being surrounded by other people who have children and just you just pick up and just go you know and sure you can read books on it and get better and uh educate yourself but also there's just like a natural instinct there same thing with gardening you know you could read tons of books you could go to school for it but like there's a natural instinct that you kind of just know that you plant the seed and and let it grow and hopefully don't give it like hyper extreme conditions so it you know doesn't die of drought or die of over being overheated and uh and if you can achieve that then it's gonna bear great fruit or great flower um 
And it's the same thing with the business too. You know, if you can uh, grow a business without it going through like too many extreme conditions. And by the way, every business, every garden is going to encounter certain crazy conditions. Like, I mean, Jer, how many times have we seen crazy conditions, windstorms, rainstorms, extreme heat, heat. Yeah. like heat. it got, you know, your, your water, uh, irrigation system like just all of a sudden malfunctions or the timer doesn't go on it's like, yeah and i then mean it's dealing it, with crisis totally and that's like it and you have to just kind of like be uh agile super agile like yeah. you can't like you have a plan but everything is going to go wrong and just knowing that that's going to happen and being okay with it and just thinking that like this is all like a learning experience and i was also one of the things you said about like you know parenting you know i read a couple parenting books but like you have an instinct like inside through like your dna like your parents your grandparents your great grandparents and like all the people that came before you that had to go through life for you to be in this moment today like that gets transferred into your dna as you are born and so like now i have a son and nine times out of 10, I have no idea what I'm doing. Like just even last night, I mean, he's up at three o'clock. I'm like, all right, dude, bouncing on like time to go to bed. And he's just like, mm, let's go walking. Let's go to the beach. It's like, dude, it's nighttime, bro. Like it's time to go to bed. Like, how do I get this human being who's wide awake at three 30? I'm freaking exhausted. How do I get him to go to sleep? And it's like, you're just inside. Just like, oh, come on, dude, go to sleep. <laughs> But then you know that like he's feeding off of that. So it's like if you're in this state, then he's going to not be, you know, relaxed to fall asleep. And then it's just like, OK, you just have to like get inside and be like, what were what would my forefathers do in this moment? <laughs> <laughs> you know? How do I get this screaming baby to just calm down and go to sleep? And, you know, eventually he does. And then, you know, he sleeps till nine o'clock and you're like, whoa, that was epic. You know, we just got 15 hours of sleep. <laughs> so I think that, I think that, you know, doing a business, but also having like a side thing that you love to do is like the most important thing. A lot of, I feel like a lot of times we get so caught up in our like strive to succeed that we don't succeed in other parts of our life. And like, if you don't have balance and you don't have that kind of like feeling of doing something that has absolutely nothing to do with your work and you're only doing it because it's something you enjoy doing, your work is going to benefit so much more than if you just like were 110% every day, all you did was eat, sleep and drink your work. You're going to burn out. But yeah. if you find some balance and you take time to go on a walk, go to the beach, go to the forest, like it doesn't have to be a five, six hour thing, like go for 30 minutes and sit on the sand and listen to the waves without your phone or sit in the forest or sit in the backyard even it doesn't matter like just go get some vitamin d from the sun and connect with the ground and like literally you'll feel energized to go back to work and you'll crush it 10 times harder also i love what josh used to say like especially with your screenwriting you know it was like i need to go and work on another project like i need complete disconnection from you know my core business to just give me give my mind um an escape so that i'm not think because i'm like always thinking about my business so or you're always thinking about your business so it's like when you're all of a sudden doing something that is uh a hobby or in the case of that like something that really inspires you as well as make you money um then you're getting a full disconnection from your core business and you can really immerse yourself in something else and that makes it so when you come back to your core business you don't feel that same like fatigue, you know? Um, yeah. And that for you, Jeremy, is maybe surfing as well, you know? Um, yeah, and, and gardening. Yeah, well, surfing I, 100%. Yeah, I also think that um, remembering why you started this business, like when you start with these businesses, you got all this energy and this excitement and this passion and drive and like, you know, it's so easy to, um, it's so easy to like forget like that drive, that passion, that love of why you started it and what like inspired you to like go down this journey because you're just, you're just a firefighter and you're just like putting out fires everywhere. And so like, it's also important to just come back to be like, what are we doing? And I think, you know, especially in packet, 
when we kind of turned this corner into to building the packet TV and the platform and like tapping back into like the, you know, you're in, the, you're stuck in like the weeds of everyday work and you're just got, you know, we got 20, you know, 26 people that are looking to us for answers every single day. And, you know, we're always just driving, but then like being able to just step back and be like, okay, what were we, what got us inspired to start this and being able to kind of look at that from that bigger picture and come back to that passion and then dive back into the nuances of the work. And now you can really just like reinvigorate yourself and be like, all right, now I remember why I'm doing this. I got my why again, why I'm, you know, showing up every morning, why I'm pushing myself, why I'm, you know, going through all these um, treacherous waters and uh, and then letting that kind of refuel yourself um, and not just getting caught into the day to day. Yeah. What would, what would you say is like from being a business business person and entrepreneur, what would you say is like if you could give one lesson to someone who's starting a business, what would you say that lesson that you would give them like piece of advice? I would say, and I think this ties into a lot of stuff Jeremy's saying is like entrepreneurism is a mind game, a hundred percent. And if you don't have your mind right, your world is in shambles. And so if you, whatever, you know, I have a morning ritual I do every single morning. And even when I like don't want to get out of bed and the world is burning and I just say like, I'm going to get up, I'm going to do my morning ritual. And then if I still hate my life, I'm going to go back to bed, but at least that propels you in the right direction. And so I think it's really important to have this mental toughness and to be able to work on your mind and to, to get your mind strong um, so that you're able to, to take on all these other things and to really be able to think clearly because it is just problem solving. And you're looking at, you know, you can go left, you can go right not necessarily one's better than the other they're just different decisions and you have to be able to make those decisions and you can't make them if your mind is in a clear um clear way what would you yeah. say jared is like from now doing entrepreneurship i mean since we've been doing businesses together dating back to 2007. <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh i would i would say my biggest takeaway from all the years of doing business, you know, there's two things I would say, do it with people that you actually enjoy working with. I think that's been kind of the best thing is obviously we all are, we're brothers and family and we enjoy being together. We enjoy talking together and we enjoy, you know, succeeding together. So I think that's really important is finding like partners that you actually like not just like partners that you think that would fit the, a position, but like people that you could go out and hang out with outside of the workforce. Um, but I would say the biggest thing would be move slowly and don't try to do too many things at once. Like I feel like a lot of times in, in any business, you're like, all right, let's do this and let's do this. Oh, we could do this. Oh, we could do that. And we can have this thing and this thing and this thing. And it's like, but if you do all those things at once, you're going to fail. It's just, it's impossible. There's not enough hours in the day for you to get everything done. But if you pick one thing and have that be the thing that you're going to make successful. And then when that thing is successful, go to the next thing. And when that thing's successful, go to the next thing. And I feel like, you know, this was the thing with radical. Like we tried to grow so fast and we are like working on 10 different projects, all 10 were just like, the best projects you've ever even heard of. But because we had, we we're spread so thin across 10 projects, we could never get anything to completion. And if we had just been like, okay, our first project's Hercules Caliber. Those were the projects that we were gonna get to be movies and be successful and nothing else mattered. And only thing that we, we you know, we raised money, we had a staff and our goal was to make Hercules and Caliber successful. And then when those things went to film and they popped, boom, onto the next project, Aladdin, you know, you know, After Dark or whatever projects were the next ones, you know, Freedom Formula, you know, there were just like so many cool, amazing projects that never got to see, you know, the success that they really should have seen because we were trying to make 20 projects succeed instead of just one. And yeah. I think that like, you know, a perfect example with Packet, you know, we have so many aspects of the projects like of the project it, it does this it does this it's a vpn it's a, a mining project it 
you know, where it, it makes it so that people can uh, build websites and have their website be, uh, you know, their their URL be a tra uh, their transaction address or their, their wallet address. Like if we had picked, if we pick just like two things that are going to be the one thing that are going to be successful. So we started off mining, mining popped. Okay. Next thing, uh, token strike, token strike got finished pop. And we just did one thing at a time. I think that we would have seen the kind of trajectory that we knew that was possible and said, we tried to do four or five things and try to move them all at the same time. And then it just becomes a slow, pro much slower process just because there's just not enough manpower. So I think that's probably the biggest lesson that i've learned and i've learned this in my music career as well pick one song that you're going to finish and get that song out go to the next song get that song finished go to the next because i right now i'm sitting on 20 songs and they're all unfinished because i've started a song and i never finished it went to the next song and now it's two three years old and it's like do i really want to go back and touch a two to three year old song or do i want to start with you know the one that's two weeks old so i think that's pretty uh pretty much the biggest lesson is like pick something that you're gonna work super hard to achieve get it to completion once it's complete and you've done everything you can for it go to the next yeah and then one and then do and then build that thing up and yeah and then the i think there's thing. a lot of pressure that entrepreneurs have and this is actually something that people investing into businesses could learn from as well because when you're investing in something, you're putting all this pressure naturally on the person who's taking the investment to achieve and to make money off of that. So there's this like uh, pressure from the entrepreneur side where it's like, okay, I, you know, took in this capital and now it, like we have to succeed with it. <clears throat> and I think that it would be really great advice from an investor to say, well, I obviously want you to use these funds correctly, but want you to keep your focus like narrow to ensure success. Because to your point, Jared, it's so easy to get distracted or th come up with 10 good ideas uh, or what you think are good ideas. But then when you're chasing 10 good ideas, then you can't move one of them to completion and put everyone's focus on one. It's, a it's actually that great um, analogy. It's like if you have 100% of your time, and you're working on 10 things, then it's going to take you 10 times longer to finish them. <laughs> and if you yeah. put 100% of your attention on one thing, then you'll be able to take that to completion in the fastest, you know, process. And so yeah, to your point, like, if you're moving a lot of pieces, you know, up the board, then it's just going to be a methodical, slow, you know, path. And if your goal is to get to revenue, and you're moving 10 things up the board, then you know, it's going to take you 10 times longer to do it. And and I think that's probably why a lot of businesses fail because they just run out of capital because they focused on too many things. Um, yeah. So that's that's definitely a great lesson. It's actually a lesson that I've struggled to stay true to because it is so easy to get distracted and because sometimes you're shooting from the hip to try and find your fastest way to revenue. Yeah. What's a, What's one that you would recommend, Jess? I, I've been thinking a lot about time and I think that the big lesson for me after running so many businesses is that it's just always going to take longer than you expect. So almost to Jeremy's point, like focus on less things, but I actually would kind of pivot it just a little bit. I would just say, you just have to give yourself more time because again, the same piece of uh information around feeling pressure from investors to get to revenue and so you say okay well we're going to get this done in six months when in your heart you're kind of going that's going to take me a year and a half mm -hmm. and so you're almost like lying to yourself that you can do it in that amount of time because you're imagining all these optimal commission conditions and minimal yeah. uh, you know um uh you know obstacles <laughs> and and you're not really taking into consideration the things that you can't think could happen but obviously continuously the unthinkable does happen and so you look at the business plan that you raised capital on six months later and you're like there's no way that we're going to hit those numbers like it's just not possible but you thought that you could six months prior 
So if I think if there's one good piece of advice, it's just maybe probably just double the amount of time that you thought you could do something in. And in that same note, because let's say you imagine that you're raising a million bucks and you're going to spend $50,000 a month to run that business, right? So that's going to give you 20 months of runway, assuming that all the capital is going, you know, to, to the, those business pieces, you're not just spending it all on operations. Like you need operating capital as well. But let's say you give yourself 20 months of runway. The best thing to, to probably do is to figure out how to just double that. So go, okay, can we run this business for 25 grand a month? You know, even though you went into it with the mindset of like, hey, we have 20 months, then you would have a lot more time. And if we had done this with Radical, we, I, that business would have succeeded in in different ways. I mean, that business was extremely successful in many ways, but in some of the key ways that it needed to succeed, we had an a, a incredible amount of capital, but from a burn rate standpoint, we didn't take our, we didn't pace ourselves well. And so we operated at a high rate. We took on a lot of projects. We had multiple divisions, right? We had comics. We had three different book divisions. We had music. We had pictures. We had toys. You know, uh, there was just all the different things that we were doing. So it was, we weren't, weren't focused entirely on our core business. And by diversifying ourselves, which we thought would mitigate against the risk of one business not succeeding, you ended up having none of the businesses succeeding to the extent you wanted them to because you were spread thin and because you increase your burn rate when you take on additional initiatives. So yeah, I would just say, give yourself more time, be ruthless around cutting costs, and, and which is the way you're going to buy yourself that extra time. And if you can set expectations, like, I don't think most investors are going to give you money and you're going to say, hey, I'm going to come back with our first revenue in four years. That's kind of the pressure that I wish that investors would say, hey, yeah, we'll give you this money. And I'd rather you I'd rather you not be a failure in two years than be an excess, a success in four. So I'll give you four. But uh, if that's not going to happen, then you can still go in with your original business plan. But then actually, instead of trying to go faster, um, just figure out how to cut costs. Yeah, and get, more time and get good wins. You know, like if you can prove your W's along the way, then um, then you can show success as you're going. And you know, it was funny because I remember when we were doing the financials for Rowdy, um, and I kept saying, "I'm like, we just need to show that we're going to lose money for two years. Like, we're just, you know, God willing, we make more money and we succeed. But like in our financials, what we're telling investors, like, we just need to prepare." To not make money for two years and then um you know just to give us that time and that ability to like you just know that shit happens you know and it really should have been four years <laughs> and unfortunately as jesse says you can't tell an investor that they're going to give you money and in four years we'll start making our first dollar you know well i mean look i think that that i think yes you're right but i also think that like investors want you to be real about the business you know so if you're saying, hey, this is the business, we're on a 10 year business model, you know, or six year business model. And like this thing that you're building is going to be so big and and world changing, world changing stuff doesn't happen overnight. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you got to you got to be OK with being able to, you know, let the work get done and find the people to help make it come to fruition, because like. When you're building technology, you know, you think the you think, you know, the Apple computer, like that first Apple computer was basically not a consumer product. The first consumer version of the computer that we all saw, who knows how many friggin' versions they had to go through to get to the consumer version. You know what I mean? So it's like with what our business is, is like we our first product that we created we thought that like this was the one this was the thing everyone people were going to be like all right this is great i could use this in my in my house i could do this i i'll you know get my neighbors online and we quickly realized that that version of our product wasn't the right fit for those types of people and so then we had to tweak it and make it and make it and then the next version of the product 
was okay so now we found our market fit for this version but then people came back and said hey it would be really cool if it did this so then we had to tweak it again and we had to get the third version and then we got that out into people's hands and then people were like you know what it would be really freaking special if it did this and you're like oh you're right so then we had to tweak it again now version four and five and six and then you're just like finally at a product where you're just like this we we have a product market fit we know who wants this product now it's about getting it out there and how do you do that you got to do marketing you got to run ads and we're you know you're finding that like you know doing a it's not like a so not a simple thing that somebody would see on you know instagram and they're like i'm gonna go buy that it's not like you're gonna see this like what's a good example like a uh, a gadget that you know charges itself from a solar panel and it can charge cell phones for you know a day like an you see that on tiktok you're probably gonna go buy that because that's yeah. pretty cool but that those people that would buy that consumer product for 20 bucks those aren't the people that are going to see a, a device that provides guest Wi-Fi for your business and go spend 250 bucks or there are 80 bucks for the first month and 24 bucks for the next month. Like those people aren't thinking about an investment in their business like that. Those people want the consumer product because they saw a cool ad and that's that. So, and then we, you know, quickly being able to like realize and learn from the data that like, how, how do we, you know, convert, you have to be able to be, like I said, just super agile and be willing to be like, all right, this doesn't work. We're moving to the next next direction. And then yeah, finding a luxury that works. That's a great point. Like That's actually such a good point is that in entrepreneurship, you have to accept. And I've actually struggled with this too because this is, this is hard to accept. You have to accept that the first thing you put out is like nine times out of 10 going to be completely not the thing. Yeah. Like you go into it with this idea. You're like, we're going to do this and you're going to do this. And then we're going to, we'll be done with that product and we'll do it. We're going to take it to market, market it. And it's going to, and, and then people are going to buy it. And you, and you created this mentality because in your spreadsheet, you basically say, this is how much it's going to cost to acquire the customer. We're going to spend that money, get the customer and then they're just going to pay. But what you're not taking into consideration is how many iterations it takes to get to the product for the product market fit. And then it's like, amazing, you have a product market fit, people actually want to buy it. But now, how do you get people to discover it? How do you get people to actually pay for it? How do you close those deals? And then there's a whole new process of iteration on the marketing side. And what's interesting for us is if we're talking about Rowdy and the mini product that we're putting out and selling guest Wi-Fi to businesses, it took us one year basically we we really well it actually took us 15 months because we started working on this in december 2022 and then all of 2023 we were grinding to get this product live and even though it began selling in march of 2023 it's taken us an entire year of iterations to figure out how to start selling it even though the product was ready it's taken us a whole year to figure out how to sell it we're still refining how to sell it and it's almost like the same number of iterations it took to get the product is the number of iterations it's taken us to figure out our marketing right yeah and like yeah. marketing and we're yeah. still figuring it out but we actually have a bunch of wins now and now you go okay this is actually working now let's put you know more emphasis more gas on the fire with these specific strategies but right. you have to give yourself time to, to iterate because it's like we put it out there, we spent money on marketing and then it didn't work. And then yeah. we made some changes, put some more money in marketing, it didn't work. And you do that like 10 times and you stay persistent. And all of a sudden you start getting successes, but 15 months have gone by and your business plan is like way behind on revenue yeah. because of how many times you've had to iterate. Yeah, yeah well, I think you gotta go for it, Josh. Yeah, yeah well, I was just gonna say that, you know, I think what I look back when we were building our business plan and when we were building our financials, we were just looking at the, you know, if you put these numbers in, this makes your five year goal, your 10 year exit, like this, these, this number equals that number and not focusing on these milestones along the way. It's like, hey, we're going to, our first milestone is this. We're going to be sprinting to accomplish this. Once we accomplish that, we're going to sprint to go get this. 
And then once we do this, we're going to sprint to get that. And I think if you can break your business plan down into these smaller milestones, then you're, you're getting those W's faster. Even if you're not like, you know, boosting revenue, at least you're able to show investors that like, Hey, we accomplished this, we accomplished milestone one. And you can like show your investor that there's progress as opposed to you go into your board meetings. They're like, all right, where's your revenue? And you're like, whoa, we're not at revenue. Why aren't you at revenue? The whole thing's about revenue. I saw these financials that showed all this revenue. Where's all the money. And, and but if you can shift your business plan to be looking at these milestones and saying, Hey, we're going to do this and this is going to get us here and this is going to get us here. And now you can celebrate those wins as opposed to having all this negativity that like your revenue projections aren't meeting what your financial projections actually are or your your your, your financial uh, actuals aren't make, matching your financial projections. Then, you know, it's very uh, demoralizing and uh, debilitating. And you're like, well, man, I just can't. It's not pumping money. But we do have so many wins and you know this product is epic and getting this product market fit and and you know we had to pivot if you remember we, when we raised this money um we were doing it in the crypto bull market you know and we were a crypto focused business and we literally were signing papers as ftx um just decimated the entire crypto industry so like everything we're like we got this money we're gonna go build this thing and then you know, literally a Mack truck comes and just hits us um, on day one when we just like first cash the check. And so we had to reinvent ourselves. And that really goes to that agility and to what Jeremy was talking about with, you know, when a torrential rainstorm comes right when you just planted some new seedlings that were looking for sunlight. Um, yeah. And so you just have to be able to navigate the, the, the storms that come and um and also just celebrate the wins as you get them yeah i was just thinking about like that conversation we had last week um i guess it was still this week but last work week um about you know packet and that like you know what do we like how, how do we like get to the, our goal right like obviously we want to see the market cap go up and we want to see this the utility out there and like all these things be accessible by people or like that by mass market people like how do we get there so what are the steps that you need to take so it's like step one what needs to get accomplished in order to get to step two and identifying what step two actually is because like we're always looking at the final goal opposed mm -hmm. to the steps to get to the final goal and so it's like okay let's just say for example we want people um anyone to be able to get on to the, uh, the packet network or build, we want anyone to be able to build a website on the packet network and use their web URL as a payment address. Cool. What do we need to do in order to get there? Well, mm -hmm. you're going to need to figure out how, like, how, how can people even build a website? Okay. Well, we got to go figure out how someone builds a website. And then you, once you figure out how to do it, you have to document it and then you have to test it. And then you have to make sure that it works on, every single computer a mac a pc uh and then once you figure that out and it's documented and there's a video and it's clear and understanding how someone does that now we have to figure out then you have to go put it out there so what what's the next step oh you got to put it on youtube you got to create a you know a blog post about it or even an article press release and you got to share it to the community and then get people to do it and then when they do it they show they like share it with the community also say hey i built this this website it works look how cool this is okay great now how do people access the website from outside of the cjdns or the packet network oh well they need a reverse vpn okay well then how do people get the reverse it's like we got to figure out what the one two three four five six seven steps are to get to the final goal and sometimes we're like so focused on the final goal that we never get to the final goal because we never created the steps to get there. And I think that that is the most important thing about any type of business planning is rarely do we have the steps on how to achieve the things that we want to achieve and how to, so if our goal is to get positive revenue, okay, well, what are the thousand steps you're going to have to do in order to get there? And you also have to have an A, B, C, D, E, F, like, in each step because sometimes shit goes the wrong way you know like for example you are raising money in a in a bull run 
and then everyone's in euphoria and then all of a sudden the markets crash and we're in a bear market for three years right when we're building a company <laughs> it's like no one could have predicted that because if you know if we had predicted that maybe we would have done things differently and like we would have you know i mean who knows what we would have what we would have done if we had known that was coming but it happened and you know it gave us time to build our our product and also it gave us time to kind of identify the things in packet that needed to get done in order to bring in mass appeal and people coming in and i've been doing a lot of research on other projects that have been in a sideways pattern for the last two years three years and what did they do what did they build during the off season or the the, the bear market in order to see their project succeed because mm. you know the last let's just say the last two months okay since january since january since the new year a bunch of projects went up and did you know what 200 300 percent all those mm. projects are back down to where they started they all had that, that like crazy spike up and then they came down and now they're back at where they originally were maybe a couple you know decimal points up maybe a mm. couple pennies up from where they were but nothing stayed up where it was everything's back down and it's and it's because those projects got some hype everyone was like oh this is going to be the future it's going to be a game changer but then everyone realized that these projects are two three years away from actually being game changer because they're new and they didn't build anything they just had some kind of euphoria hype and bitcoin was rising and people threw all their money into these alt projects and then they came crashing down and now they're in a sideways pattern and then the Bitcoin having is going to happen. So it's like with with I think that my I guess my point is, is that like you just have to be prepared for so many things to go different ways. And like you'll never nothing will ever happen the way you want it to happen. You always it's always going to change. And that's what's kind of exciting and fun. It's like nothing's predictable. If it was predictable, shit, everyone would do this, do this, you know, but people don't like that unpredictability. And so what do they do? They go do a nine to five job because they know every week or every month they're going to get their paycheck because they work X amount of hours and they're going to be away from their families. They're going to be stuck inside. And that kind of security works for people. Yeah. But like for us, you know, that's never worked for us. I don't think, I mean, the only time I've ever had like a real nine to five job was at Radical. And that kind of was, it kind of like took your, like soul being in an office all day you know and like you would just try to every second you could to just go outside and go for a walk and just be outside the friggin in the sunshine i yeah. think that like that's important you know yeah for sure yeah. well those are like definitely some good lessons <laughs> some yeah. war wound lessons so okay so separate from business so we talked about things that we do you know that are not business related and you know to keep ourselves sane and then obviously a lot of lessons you know within the business space what would you say is like outside of business outside of hobbies like what are the other things that you've been loving to do these days Jer? well i have a you know one and a half year old so spending time with him and watching him like just exp you know unveil the world is the probably one of the coolest things ever you know just watching him like speak words and like try to express himself of what he wants or like that's like and like taking him to the beach because i mean obviously i love the beach and i if i could i'd be in the water all day every day and seeing his love for the beach has been really really epic um but yeah i think like just i think for me I just want to be outside as much as possible and be in nature and just be grounded to the earth. I think that for me is the most important part about living. It's like, we're not meant to be stuck inside all day. And so I've been trying to, like Josh said, have, have your rituals, you know, I think that's really important. Have your kind of like routine. Um, obviously my routine is again, I have to switch it up because sometimes I'm up at four in the morning until, you know, or I'm up at eight, you know, like today I got to sleep in till eight 30. I can't even remember the last time I slept into eight 30. Um, but yeah, just, I think that like finding some kind of routine has been really rewarding for me. 
and spending time with my family. Obviously, I miss you guys. I haven't seen you guys in a couple months, but I feel like we're we talk every single day, multiple times a day, and we work together. So that's that's cool. But yeah, I think that just you know, I've been just enjoying surfing. The waves here have just been unreal. This has been it's crazy. This year here in in Santa Cruz has been like the best year of waves best winter of waves in like on the part of town that i live in 20 years and it just happened to be the year that i moved back home here to santa cruz and i just can't even believe how good the waves are it's just like every time i go check the waves it's firing and it's just like you look or you look on the beach and there's one sandbar two sandbar three sandbar there's like 10 sandbars in like a friggin' quarter mile stretch and you just pick the one that you think looks the best and go have an hour surf. And that's been really great for me, except I have, I'm not even kidding. I have the worst armpit rash I've ever had in my 38 years on planet earth. It's like <laughs> so insane. I can't even believe that it's even possible for a human being to have a rash like this, but I think <laughs> it's pretty gnarly, but it's just from surfing, you know, and my, your wetsuits just in your pit and you're just paddling. So yeah. gotta, I think I need a couple day break, but yeah, I think just <laughs> surfing and being with, <laughs> being with the family, keeping, uh, has it been helping me keep like a, a positive mind and outlook. And, um, I've also been just really enjoying like the excitement of the crypto markets. It was funny, Jesse, you showed me, um, this video of this guy on how he can make like three to 500 bucks a, a day, just doing like trading these, like sh these shit meme coins on Solana. <laughs> and it was so crazy, dude. So I put in like 80 bucks and I basically lost pretty much eight, all, almost all of it right away. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was, uh, and so I look, I went on to another YouTube video and I was like watching how to like read the charts because when you're doing these Solana shitcoin meme uh, trading, you're on the one second chart, like literally one second, and you're watching it go up and down, up and down, and learning what the charts actually mean. So if it goes up like this and up like this and up like this, you're more likely going to go smashing down double top. And so last night I was uh, watching it and I saw this shitcoin go on because uh, you I forget what it's called. Um, I forget what the, I think it's like Dex something Dex whatever the whatever the uh, website is that you can look at these ship meme coins that they, what it does is it charts any shit coin that goes on the market it will get, it will make it so you can chart it and oh, somebody Dex screener. Like Dex screener and so uh, I only look on the Solana chain and you use this Telegram uh, bot to be able to buy these shit coins and sell them. But Solana has been so congested that like I couldn't, I can't get like, I, I can't get the buys or the sells to go through. Um, and so last night I'm watching this one and it's on, been on for six minutes. It does a double top and comes crashing down. And I'm like, oh, this is the one I go to buy and I never got my buy in. And I literally blinked. Next thing you know, it's up 2000%. Like literally, I'm not even kidding. From where I was trying to buy, I tried to buy it, failed. Tried to buy it, failed. And the next thing you know, it's up 2,000%. I'm like, what? <laughs> Bro, like what the heck? You know, I couldn't believe it. I was telling my wife and she's like, why didn't you buy it? I was like, I was trying. It wouldn't let me buy it. And it was yeah. some shit coin. And then I just looked at it just now. Dead. No, it's 100%. There's $2 in liquidity in it. So like <laughs> these, 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 these coins, and it started with like 15K when I looked at it and had been on, on and it was locked too. So somebody lost 15K, but a lot of people made some, some decent money. You know, I mean, I only had like a hundred, maybe a hundred bucks in Solana in there and I could have made a thousand bucks easy, $2,000 off of that. If wow. I had been able to, if it had been able to go through. So I was pretty, uh, pretty gutted about it, but <laughs> yeah, the trading so stuff close. has been crazy. Um, well, Josh, what, what have you been doing? That's not, that's not, not business and not like your side hobby. Yeah. Well, you know, as you know, my side hobbies are my other businesses, but not <laughs> those hobbies. Um, yeah, well, you know, I've been, as you know, I've been traveling for years and, um, and you know, I I moved back to LA when I was 
18 years old, really like 17 and a half. And I built this amazing community here. Uh, and I think it was a, a big testament to a lot of the success in my businesses, just having this community of people that I could always turn to and we're just, you know, a stone's throw away. And I felt that I really wasn't nurturing those relationships while I was traveling. And also, as I've gotten a little older, my uh, my interests in things have shifted. So I've really been focusing on just building community in my personal life, which obviously reflects into my business life. Um, but yeah, just really trying to find things that I'm very interested in and, you know, the spiritual realm and, um, and fitness realm and just really getting, getting that community built as, you know, I feel like I've gone out like every single night this week, which is very different from my life where I'm usually working you know, 12 to 15 hours a day. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's been really nice to start just building community, building relationships with people. Um, and then really just focusing on fitness as well. It's been a, a big part of my life since I was, I don't know, I think I started working out when I was like 14 or 15 years old. And so, um, just getting into a rhythm of my fitness and, and staying healthy has been great. And, it's it's another you know fitness is a lot like business too it's like you don't just show up to the gym one day and like you're just jacked you know like you're at the gym every single day you wake up you go and spend an hour you only have 30 minutes you're spending 30 minutes on it and like it's this slow process of just going and just strengthening your body and just working and then over time you see the results of all your work every day but it's not a, you don't just show up at the gym and just like yeah jack now i just lifted a you know 10 pound weight and now i'm the man um it's and you're slowly like getting stronger and watching your your abilities increase and your stamina and all this stuff so that's something that i've always loved to do and it's a part of my life and when i don't do it i i feel shitty and like that you know i feel slower and so um, yeah I've, I've been really focusing a lot of energy on on those things you know and i I think community is so important uh, for our business too, for, for packet and building that community. Um, you know, we've been building that thing for five years now, really. And, um, and yeah, I think having community, having people that are going on this journey with you is, is super important and just leaving your house. And, um, and so, yeah, I've been pushing myself. I mean, naturally I'm a pretty introverted person, but I've just, always pushed myself to get out of that mindset um, of these like limiting beliefs. And, uh, and, and it really every, you know, even in social situations, you know, being able to push yourself out of your comfort zone. Um, and, and that's work too. That's these small little increments of getting better at just walking up to strangers and having a conversation or meeting new people or just having the confidence to, uh, to talk to people. Um, I think that's a, that's a great muscle to be able to train. And some people are really good at it. They can just, you know, walk up. My friend Noli was always just like amazing. He could just walk up to the biggest celebrity in a room and be like, Hey, what's up? Nice to meet you. Let's be best friends. And, and then they would be at the end of that conversation. And that's such a skill, you know? Uh, and it's something that I've always worked at. And I, I, I you know, I've, I've always been able to level myself up to get into, rooms that i have no business being in just by having the tenacity and and the audacity to think that i belong in those places um and that's a muscle that i've been exercising for 20 years uh, and it's such a valuable thing even though naturally that's not the you know that's not the person i i was uh i or not the person that i thought that i was supposed to be but um but it's it's a muscle and, and a skill set that can be developed and and so that's been a place where i've been focusing a lot of energy is just building my community yeah it's cool because you're now back down in los angeles and there's just so much stuff happening between your life on the west side and then also all of your friends that are all over the city and there's obviously a lot more going on in la than almost any city in the world Definitely up there in the top 5% of cities that have shit going on. Yeah. Josh, I've never thought of you as introverted. You've always been like 
the jokester, the lively friggin' dude in the family. So it's funny to hear you think of yourself as introverted because I think you're probably saying like more like mentally inter introverted because yeah. like physically you're always out there. But yeah, I think it's like hard to get out of your head where you yeah. as Josh was saying, like just having the tenacity to to push yourself because your instinct, even when you're in a crowded room, like let's say you got, you know, some nice fits on you're at the right party and then you're there and there's 500 people around you. And now you have to like force yourself <laughs> to go like talk to people and interact yeah. with people. And I'm the worst at that. It's I tough, like, dude, you know, I yeah. know you, you guys always want to go to these like events. Like when we all lived in LA, like we go to an event and I'm like, I have to now talk to people. I have to walk yeah. up to people and yeah. be like, Hey, what's up? My name's Drew. It's funny now. Like it's funny as being like a father, I have like no fear of like walking up to anybody and having a conversation. I always, Erica always like gives me a hard time. Be like, God, you're such a dad. Like, why'd you have to, like, it's funny. You know, remember dad would always say like <laughs> weird jokes or like, be, like say things to people. Grandpa. Like, like the other day we were at, uh, Erica and I went and got a beer. Sorry to interrupt, but I just have to tell this. We went and got a beer and this dude, this guy had a dog. And he and, we're, and we sit down, we're drinking our beer, and this dog like comes up and it's like sniffing me, and I was like, oh, and I pet it, and we're like, oh, what's his name? And it's like, he's like Amanda. I was like, oh, that's a basic name. It's like, <laughs> why did I say that's a basic <laughs> name to this guy and a dog? And it's like haunted me ever since. Eric was like, oh my god, you just told this guy his dog's name was basic. <laughs> it's just like just stuff like that where you're just like, I'm like. I don't even know if it's, it's gotta be from just like our dad saying just, and, and <laughs> our grandparents or grandpas, they always said like, just like the most grandpa Mark. Grandpa grandpa Mark. Mark. Yeah. So whenever you have a kid, you just, just you lose Dude, your filter. I swear. It's just, is like a, it's like a, it's it just all of a sudden you just become, once you become a, a father, like you just start saying like most inappropriate weird shit that like you didn't mean to say, but like it just came out. And then it just gets worse and worse as you become a grandfather. And well, yeah, you just become creepy and like you can't say that <laughs> shit to like young people. You say the same things, but now you're like an old guy and you're like, yeah. Wait. Yeah, that was cool to say when you're in your 20s, but not when you're in your 80s. You could say it when your kid was one and a half, but now your kid's 30. Like you can't say it. <laughs> Yeah, well, but that feeling that you're talking about of just like, I don't know what to say to people. Like, I feel that all the time. And that, like, so naturally, if you feed into that feeling of like, um, I don't even know what to say to anybody, like, then you're just like in the corner, like crying by yourself. And like that feelings inside of me always because I have major social anxiety, but nobody would ever know. And, and anytime I tell people that I'm like naturally introverted, they're like, no, you're not. Shut up. Yeah. Um, and but it's like having that feeling and then doing it anyways, you know, it's like having that fear and then doing it anyways. And that's, that's why I do cold plunges. That's, you know, you go into a cold plunge. It's like that water's 41 degrees. Like that's cold. Like that's not going to feel good in your body, but all the benefits of it are going to be great. So you do it anyways. Um, and, and as you can train yourself to be like, look, nobody's ever become successful sitting in their room doing nothing. Like that's just never happened. You know, everybody's pushed themselves out of their comfort zone. And if you want to have relationships, you want to have successful businesses, you want to have friends, you want to go and do things, you just have to get out of your own way and change that mindset. And it's okay to be scared. And it's okay to be self-conscious and it's okay to have all these feelings. But like, to do it every anyway and not let your limited beliefs limit your life. And, and that's just always been a practice of mine since I was a kid. And I somehow I've had good people around me that have pushed me and I've always pushed myself um, and, and have a, a good support system that can catch me when I, you know, face plant. That's such a good one though. That's like, I love that analogy. I would say that's probably the most salient, like, uh realization for any human being no matter what because we always want things but we also want things to be easy and those are not that's not a combination that works like if you want a relationship you're not going to get that by just swiping you know like you got to get out of your house like you got to go meet people you need to go put yourself in public places 
Um, you need to go take risks. You need to go travel, like whatever that is, but you got to leave, you know, the nest. If you want to raise money, you can't do it by sending emails. You can't do it by even just picking up a phone. Like you have to get out. And I remember when Radical, when we first started Radical, we had raised like a few hundred grand. I think we had, yeah, we had raised a few hundred grand, maybe like two or 300 grand. We were basically always out of money. And we came up with this idea to have uh, Barry, my, our, our business partner, go on a trip. And we took the absolute last dollars. I think we had like 20 or 25 grand. He was like, I'm going to go to Singapore. I'm going to go to New York. <laughs> I'm going to go to London. And um and we we that we were like well that's those tickets just the tickets and the travel like that's going to be all the money we have. And it was basically like we're either going to run out of money sitting in LA because you can't raise money in LA. That's the one rule about LA. There's no money available there. It, it, you could find money potentially for a movie investment, but most likely not. And um you can't raise money for businesses in LA. It's just not going to happen. I, the, the amount of people that do that, it's like a fraction of a percentage. So it would, you'd be naive to think you can. So anyways, we're sitting in LA trying to raise money. It's not going to happen. And so we just scrapped it together and put together this, this road show. And he took off for, it was like a two, two and a half week trip. And, and actually on that trip, he ended up meeting this investor and the investors like how much money are you raising and, and he said we're raising you know five million dollars and the guy was like all right great I'll, I'll give you half of it and so he comes back on the from this trip he gives me a call he's like oh, great news i just met the investor you know he's gonna give us two and a half mil and i'm just like oh my god like it worked you know when's he sending the funds he's like oh we didn't work out we didn't work out that detail but he said he's gonna finance it he's gonna finance it. i was like but we're out of money like next week. And he's like, well, we're going to have to go get money from someone else because this guy's going to give us money. But like, I don't know when it's going to happen. And it was crazy because as a virtue of getting out and doing that, um, that's where the lead came from. And then the lead gave us something to build towards. And because we ended up landing that person who said yes, a couple other people who we had been talking to also then realized where there's smoke, there's fire. So they started coming in and saying, yeah, yeah, we want to be involved too. And that's what ended up creating this like alchemy that ended up leading to us raising over $20 million, going from absolutely having nothing. And so it just shows like, you just got to get out of your comfort zone. Like you, you yeah. have to, because your instinct is just to curl up in a ball and fail totally. um, because it's hard, you know, and it's scary. And like you're the fear of rejection, the fear of failure. Um, but also just like, the fear of the unknown. And so if you can challenge yourself to do hard things, uh, to take the risk, to, to kind of step into the unknown, um, then you'll most likely be rewarded, even if it's not on that first one, but you got to keep going. You know what I always think about is Indiana Jones, where he has to step out into the abyss and, and like believe that the step's going to be there. You know, that scene where it's like the invisible bridge and you just have to like step and just like yeah. you can't see where the step is and you know it's a cliff and you know you're stepping off of a cliff and you just like have totally. to have to believe <laughs> that the invisible bridge is there. Yeah. Um, but that's literally, you know, business 101. Yeah, and that's it. That's what I did. But I, I literally threw everything in storage, jumped on a plane and flew around the world to go raise this money and to go tell people about this project. And I didn't know anybody. I didn't know where I was going. I just, you know, somebody said, go there. I went there. Someone said, go here. I went there. And I just took that leap of faith. And that's how we went and raised the money for Rowdy um, was just through just doing it anyways. You know, there's so many unknowns. It was, you know, treacherous time. And, you know, crypto hadn't even started running at that time when we started, when I started the journey, um, or it just started to kind of wake up again. But, um, but yeah, you just kind of got to take that leap of faith and you got to believe in yourself. You know, um, I think it's, it's really about knowing you're capable of it 
and not letting all the bullshit get in the way that's telling you that you should go the easier path. Um, but but just staying true to yourself and and just keeping that mental toughness and your eye on the prize. And if you can believe in yourself, then literally anything is possible. And other people will believe in you if you believe in yourself. Yeah. So it's like that's how Packet went from a $10 million market cap to a $350 million market cap in the bull run. You know, this cycle, I think we'll see well over a billion dollar market cap. And it's just from being, you know, persistent beyond imagination. All right. So yeah. two more things. Two more well, things. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah. We got to go back. You have to answer the question. Oh, yeah. I would say kind of you kind of yeah, riff, yeah. but you should it, we should send it back to you. Mine that I've been doing that's non-business, non-hobby is having Luna, having a dog uh, yeah. for, you know, this year. I think that that's been just it, it's really helped me kind of uh, stay balanced because I'm so pulled. So I have such a high tendency to just be locked in and. And pushing towards my goals and trying to manage multiple businesses and you know i put a lot of pressure on myself to achieve but you know luna has uh, her own clock and she doesn't speak english no speak key. so she doesn't speak when, human <laughs> she doesn't speak human so when she wants to you know do something like she's very her her like physical animation her nonverbal communication is so funny and i like know exactly what she wants and she behaves in a certain way to because she knows that that's how she gets my attention and yeah she has to she has to go on a walk in the morning and then eat and then she naps for most of the day but then like right around three or four she like has to leave the house and like has to go on an adventure so i've been planning adventures for her and I like every day. I mean, it's just every day. It's not, it's not even a Monday to Friday thing. It's like every day she needs that. And um, so I'm very like in recognition of it. And that's what's been helping me connect back into, you know, going outside, going to a park, going to a beach, going on a hike, going on a walk. Um, and and then and then she, you know, it's not just taking her to a dog park, like she wants to play with me and we run around together and stuff. So it's been cool to be tuned into her energy. And I think that's been helping me, you know, stay, stay balanced. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been surfing and I haven't been working out. I haven't even been so eating well. You, so you gotta get, you I'm gotta just get like, I've just been blowing it. But, you, you know, just missed the whole I know, Shame. I missed the whole, I know, I know. It's really <laughs> bad. Um, I did surf a good, a good number of times, but not, not consistently at all. Actually, surf's been pretty shitty here in Santa. This was a terrible winter for Santa Barbara, um, unfortunately. But and then I was traveling on a couple of the good swell days, and yeah, it's just I've been out of out of sync with the ocean. But I think I'll have a better summer, better summer, and I've been wanting to get back into working out. But I had a huge transition moving, you know, to my new place, and uh, and really carrying these businesses has really had a tremendous weight on my shoulders and I, it's definitely affected my mental health a lot this last six months has been like probably some of the toughest you know that i've dealt with uh but you know we're like the way that i work is weird like i'm very introverted until i crack a code so it's like if i'm solving a problem like some turing effect like my brain is just like trying to solve this this problem and then once i solve it i i just like open up i'm just like oh my gosh okay now i'm i've like cracked the code and um and i've been stuck trying to crack this code for packet and and rowdy for like the last year maybe even two years has been like really just trying to figure it out but particularly the last year and in the last like week <laughs> actually like on Tuesday or Wednesday, I think it was Tuesday actually. I was hanging out with my friend. We actually went to this uh to this weed lounge in LA that he became a member of called Astra. And I'm like sitting up there. It's like the early games for March Madness. He invited me to come meet him over there. He rolled up a blunt. I haven't smoked in a long time. And and I'm just sitting there with him, like, and I was just my brain's just been thinking about how to solve a couple of these problems with our businesses. And I explained it to him with 
like drink coasters and like an incense stick and uh and a lighter <laughs> like all the things that were on the table and i like i was like this is the internet and this is you know and i just like laid it all out and all of a sudden when i looked at this table <laughs> it's like a beautiful mind moment i was like oh my god i just explained it out loud like that's it that's it like i've solved it and so i called you josh and i was like all right i need to tell you like what just happened and then i called jeremy i was like i need to tell you what just happened and then i literally like voice noted into my phone into like a google doc um everything i just said and i just read it back and i was like oh my god i just figured it out so now i'm like super hyped because oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like a huge milestone that i struggled to try and articulate what the fuck we've been do trying to work on for the last five years and <laughs> it finally ties back to like <laughs> the whole reason we started this when we originally whiteboarded this in my backyard in 2017 and um actually was it 2016 it might have been like i think it was like it had been 2015 actually no and i remember no it was like when it was like when greg we had the i put the whiteboard in the backyard i was sitting on the couch Dude, and we it had to have been 2015 when you guys started thinking about it because i had moved to santa barbara in 2016 at the end i moved to santa barbara at the end of 2015 and you guys were like because it was in it was at the crescent heights house when this I happened know. You know, so anyways, yeah, I've been working on it for a long time. And uh and and we like had this idea of how this tech could change the movie business, but it was just such a pipe dream, it just didn't exist. Yeah. And I've been saying like for the last like maybe six months, I was like, I think we're almost there, but I didn't know how it worked. And then yeah, literally on Tuesday, I just like you know, figured it out. So now I'm feeling pretty energized. Um yeah. and like like motivated i've actually felt like really unmotivated recently like hard to get myself able to do things um which is why it's been good that luna's like take me to the beach because i'm like oh i just want to sit here and try and crack the code but um i think that's been keeping me sane for sure for the last little bit and um the other thing that's also you guys are gonna hate this one but like we got into sports gambling um and which is like the most wasteful wasteful time wasteful on time and wasteful on money thing realize that it's not a way to make money at all it's a pure hobby um and um <laughs> it's just, and i lost you heard so it here money. first everybody yeah and, wish. But what i will say is that i it's like really given me like a release from my work and i just needed to be able to pull myself out of just being like fixated on work you know and so it's like i can like really started to appreciate sports a lot more. Um, and I also appreciate like the athleticism and the strategy and the perseverance and like so much mental toughness that goes into it. So I draw a lot of parallels between it, but yeah, I mean, outside of those things, um, you know, I've never cared about March madness like ever. And it's like March madness. And I'm like interested in it and being like, Whoa, this is crazy. It's also, I got to say, the most sports is the most incredible marketing i've ever seen yeah, like definitely. it is so fucking incredible how much money is pumped into the marketing on these schools on these brands on the new thing that's called nil and we should talk about it another time but um which is the name um image and likeness that now uh college athletes can basically sell their image just like yeah, a yeah, nba and now they're getting paid fucking loot and um and it's changed the whole like face of, of college sports and now also that individual players are getting like famous um you know it increases the the brand value of these schools and the schools are charging you know 40 50 million dollars for the broadcast rights for their athletes to play you know various sports it's just really crazy to see how much money is over there and um not directly applicable to our business but kind of inspiring to see to immer or, um, immerse myself a little bit into the consumerism around sports and then like you look at all the ads that are running for like hamburgers and you know you know coffee and stuff like this and you just go okay you know this is where this is how our uh especially american um consumerism is is happening so it's like if we're trying to sell products to people that are buying this stuff and being marketed to this way 
it's kind of given me a way to tune in, tune out of our core business, tune into what's also going on out in the world and kind of be um, like front row seat to that consumerism and figure out ways to apply that uh, to ultimately the way we need to sell our products, services, technologies, businesses, um, you know, to the, to the masses. So that's been, I think, good for me to just be able to, you know, step away from um, the desk. That's great. Yeah, I, I, I know you had a couple, uh, another question, but I wanted to ask you guys, did you see during the Super Bowl how like the Chiefs were like, there was a, there was a moment in that, like the final drive that ended up make them winning the Super Bowl. And they were like on fourth down. It was like fourth and three, and it automatically switched to first and ten. And yeah, then the next yeah. drive, they scored and won. Well, no, no, no. So here's a crazy thing. So I saw that that Instagram post, and I, because I've been doing sports, I subscribe to uh, to the NFL app, and I could watch the old watch the game. So I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna go back and watch the replay. Was it? Was it? No, that was right? real. That oh, fucking was that really happened. Like, what was crazy is like that they really did skip a down in that final drive, but it ended up not mattering because even though it sh they gave him another first down, the next pass, he got a 12 yard play. So it's like, well, it what I'm saying though, down. what I'm saying, it was a fourth was, down, but and no, they would have done a different play. It would, right, it was, right. four, it would have been, it would have been a different play and it could have not happened, you know? So like it would have been fourth and three and they might've kicked a field goal opposed to trying to win it. They might've tied. That it. was a crazy. Yeah, I mean, I just can't believe no one saw that. That was yeah. like, there's legitimately a skip. Like they gave them a second down. I actually don't think it was fourth. I think it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, was third, it was third down. And then they went to fourth and three or something. And then it went to first and 10. Yeah, we should let's 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 cue it up next time and show yeah. it on here because yeah, that that shit was crazy. But um, yeah, there is what I will say. Here's the other piece of this: is that AI and sports is a whole different fucking ball game right now. Like, yeah. if you're the reason why, I mean, gambling was always you know crazy, but now if you're gambling, you're gambling against the freaking computer. And, yeah. and it's just like, it doesn't matter what you're kind of, how tuned in you are into, you know, this team, that team, what's going on. There's other forces at play um, that you can't account for. And, you know, we were watching, just talking about football for a second. Like I was watching a thing on Barstool uh, Instagram and they posted these videos where they were basically saying that the ref that was chosen to um, for the playoff game for who gets to go to the Super Bowl for the Chiefs game is uh, somebody who like always penalizes the home team, and because the Chiefs were going to be playing it, you know, away for the playing game, that the home team was going to get like bad calls, and they called it before the game, and they were like, "That's because." NFL wants the Chiefs to go to the Super Bowl because Taylor Swift, you know, is going to be the biggest, you know, draw for new people coming into the NFL. And it's bigger than, you know, the winner of the Super Bowl. It's about how many people are going to watch and getting bigger numbers than the year before. And it's like NFL wants the Chiefs in the and you kind of want to go, oh, you're putting on the tinfoil hat. That's a bullshit. Well, that played out exactly. And if you look at how the refs played, there were just a couple questionable calls on to, on the home team so that, that penalized uh, them giving, you know, the chiefs just that extra tiny little edge. It's kind of crazy you know, though. Because they still like, going to win the game, but like those couple calls are crazy. And like I, on March madness yesterday, um, there was a game uh, actually it was a uh, day before yesterday. So it was, um, what was it uh, Thursday night? And it was uh, Samford, um, it's which which were like the underdogs by like thirteen points, right? So they're losing a hundred percent that game. That's how it's set up, and they end up they're down by like twelve, with about two or three minutes left. They bang like three three pointers, and and it's they're down by two two or three. No, they're down by three. The other team, I can't remember who they're playing against, um, comes running down the lane, goes up for a slam dunk, like on a breakaway. The guy jumps up and puts his hand up to block him from the back. 
and and touches all ball. The ball goes out of the guy's hands. He goes to slam with no ball. He ends up missing the rim and like kind of falling on his back. It was kind of a hectic fall. And so they call a foul. They go back and review this. And the Samford player who pulled this block off, it is the cleanest. Like he doesn't make contact with the guy at all. It's the cleanest touch. He puts his hand, it's all ball, knocks the ball out of the guy's hand. And then they give the favored team two free throws. He bangs them both and they have two seconds left and they lose the game. You know, so it's like, that's a fully, you know, otherwise it would have been a block. Sanford would have had the ball. They could have gone down and scored one, you know, basket and they're up by one and win the game with two seconds left. Like that could, you know, could have swung the other way, but that would have been an underdog, you know, winning. And there'd been so many underdogs who won. It was just too close. Now, of course you could say, if you're going to be down it. to the wire yeah, and, you know, and you needed a re- and it was like one ref call that made it. So you lose, then, you know, you just didn't yeah, get well, it. But it's also just to show that like, these games are rigged to an extent. Like, I mean, I think to an extent, I think yeah, like you still you might need a tin foil hat for this one. No, I'm just no, saying like true, these dude. lines There's are no so question. here's the thing. Like the lines are so sharp. So it's like, it's just so sharp. Now, by the way, if you had bet on that game and you had bet for Samford to win, you'd pick plus 12 points. You would have won your bet. So that's yeah. cool. But yeah. where March madness, like the crazy money comes in is betting on the money line. So betting for Samford to win was probably like three to one odds, you know, put down a hundred bucks, win, you know, 300 bucks, put down a thousand bucks, win 3000 bucks. So it's like, you know, that's a great, you know, that that's, that's the big money. And well, obviously you know, Vegas books, you know, don't want you to get that. So like the refs are, you know, I always wonder, play. I always wonder if they know like what the Vegas books look like before the game starts. And then sure. the ref can de- oh, look determine at who's going to win. ESPN. Well, I mean, it's just, there's so much, there's so many question marks there. You just don't know, but yeah. think about how much money, I mean, it's like you have all the money that's going into the, the broadcast rights. Then you have all the ad money and then you have all the gambling money. Like there is globally, yeah. <laughs> it, 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 these are huge, huge multi-billion dollar businesses. And then you have AI and every single game now is run through AI um, where they do analytics on every single player stat, every single trend, you know, looking at the most recent games, who's injured, who's not, how they're playing, like, you know, coaching all the different things. And it goes into an algorithm. And then you have betters running their own algorithm to try and figure out which bets to play. And then you've got the, you know, the bookies, I mean, the, uh, the odds makers who are running their algorithm to figure out how to sharpen the line. And I mean, I can't tell you how many bets come down to a half point. I mean, you lose, yeah. it's called being, Oh, you know, losing, we know losing so by the hook. You, you, know, got, or it's you can either be gambling on college sports. You could be gambling on Solana shit coins. And if you see either of my brothers living out of a dumpster, then you know how they got there. <laughs> Only bet what you're willing to lose is the biggest. A hundred percent. I think that's the hundred percent it. Like you can't look at that as a profession. <laughs> I will say that, you know, there's some technical analysis that goes into both. And if you're a, yeah. a sharp better, or if you're a sharp trader, like you can make a fuck ton of money. But yeah. if you think that you're going to come out of, the moon, dude. What's if, you're, if you think you're going to come out of like, <laughs> An Instagram video and start making a hundred G's a year without losing a hundred. I G's will first. say though, <laughs> there's been a couple, couple crypto coins that I called three months ago and I sent to you guys Sui, ZRX, and if if we had all gone into Dapx, you know, what which one? Dapx. Oh, Dapx. I mean, dude, I, I, mean, I, bought, I bought ZRX at you know thirty cents. It went up to one hundred and forty or a dollar forty. I bought Sui at, you know, 60 cents and it been up at like a dollar 60. I mean, I only put 200 bucks in these projects because I just didn't know. But like pff, you put a thousand dollars in there, you would have freaking, you know, I'll tell you right now, I don't think of investing in crypto as gambling, like no, betting on long coins that are been on trading for six minutes. That's straight up that's gambling, gambling because of all the scams that are that are being propagated there. Right. And, and, you know, the problem is with sports betting is that, you know, it's designed for you to, you know, there's a lot of psychological manipulation and there's a lot of other stuff happening there. So yeah, bet what you can lose. And there's no shame in just like 
bet in it just being a fun thing like throw 25 or 50 bucks at something and just see if you if you hit if you don't you lost 25 bucks it's like i just spent 25 bucks on like two beers the other night so it's like yeah, i don't really it, think about it like that you know it's there's there's also different nuances of crypto trading you know like if you're going and betting on a blue chip project yeah there's right it's not gambling but gambling. if you're going on the Solana shit coins that Jeremy was just doing. Oh, that's like, 100% these gambling. are a hundred percent pump and that's dump gambling. bullshit. That's like, you just need to catch the bottom, sell at the top. And it's a fucking totally. Ponzi scheme. But, like, but if you watch, gambling. but if you learn the, what the charts look like and how there, there is a science to the, these charts. So if it no goes problem. and it hits a top true. and it goes down and hits another top, you can 99.9% .9 it's coming all the way down. Yeah, and then no. if it does like one and it comes down, it's probably going to go back up there and test it. And if it breaks that, then it's going to go up again. So it's like no. you just have to know what you're looking at and yeah. be willing well, to like education. So as yeah, you get sharper, and you can do your technical analysis. You can come in and what what I um someone posted a funny tweet and it was like the new Solana chain, like all the meme coins that are launching on Solana is just is just traders versus scammers just figuring out who can rug the other one first yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, the, like, and the liquidity providers i mean they're the biggest everyone's just trying ruggers. everyone's just seeing who can rob the for the other guy before you know yeah. it goes to zero i just that, saw an, i just saw an influencer he just wrote on a big influencer like this guy's making millions millions each bull run you know multi-millions yeah. i think he said he made uh, like almost three million last on last run but he just said he sold all of his crypto because I he's out one hundred percent. Because except for XRP, I don't right. know if it was. I don't know. You know, he oh. wrote he's out a hundred percent, no crypto in the markets because of everybody's rugging each other, and it's just like not. He just can't handle the friggin' yeah. the, the right. projects that he believes in, and he and he posts about them, and then the uh, then the then the you know founders or the you know the majority holders throw a rug in there and they pull out all the liquidity and he's standing there with egg on his face and a freaking negative balance in his book. <laughs> he's like, fuck this, I'm out. Yeah. So it's like, that's why I'm like, yeah, look, I put a hundred dollars into the salon of shit mean coins to see if I can make some money. That's just because I like to gamble. I like sitting there with the chart and selling yeah. and buying and selling yeah, and it's buying. Fun. But, it's a hobby. but I also, you know, put my, I've invested in about 12 different coins that I'm, I don't care if they're down, you know, 30% right now, because yeah. I believe in the projects. And I think that the sectors of like compute, uh, what is it? Uh, decentralized science is a huge one. I think AI is huge. And I think, uh, crypto gaming is huge. I think Pete yeah. being able to play games to earn crypto yeah. is like every friggin' nerd's dream. Like yeah. you, people who play games online all day long in their bedroom already, mm -hmm. why not make money doing it? Yeah, it seems totally. like a good thing, you know. Yeah, totally. So. No, those are you. You just have to decipher, and I and I think that's the point that I was trying to make is that like, there. It's like, oh, I invest in crypto. It's like, cool. They're not all the same. It's like I invest in stocks. It's like, oh, are you are you doing penny stocks? Are you on the Nasdaq? Or like, what are you are you doing? Canadian bonds? chain? Are you yeah? Are you EFT is like what are you what? Being an, a, an investor is such a broad term and, and being in crypto is such a broad term too. And so you have to really look at this, you know, tens of thousands of tokens and coins and what's your strategy with each one. If your strategy is to go and make a, you know, do a day trade and, and make 500 bucks, like that's a strategy, you know, if your yeah. job, if your goal is to buy low and sell high over the next two year bull run, then like that's a strategy. But, you know, we, I think we said it on one of our previous podcasts is like, just have a strategy and not all crypto is treated equally. Yeah. And stick yeah. to your game plan. Don't be scared of a little bit of a negative in your balance book. <laughs> yeah. yeah or, that's, that's or and take profits. Take profits. Take profits. Make sure you got some money for the dip. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, well what one you, thing what I just to... wanted to bring up before we, okay. before we sign off is, yeah. um, is we had, we had the bet. Oh yeah, um, where did it go to? Oh, dude, it went down to eight k. So I win. What eight k? Yeah, didn't you guys see that the hit BTC or HTX? Oh. It went down. <laughs> it, it it flash crashed to like eight thousand. So just pay me up, baby. Oh my god. <laughs> Bro, <laughs> dude, that's no so way. Funny. Are we gonna let that stand, dude? That's. Dude, I mean, wait, what was that on? It was on 
uh, which it was which like exchange? I think it was on HTX Bitmax. or, or Bitmax. No, it was on, Bitmax. I think it was Bitmax. Let me see yeah. if I can so, find. Well, it. Dude, like tell, this, tell the story. What happened? Yeah, Jerry, explain what happened. Oh yeah, yeah so I'm basically, yeah, somebody somebody opened up a, a wallet like a the dormant wallet and threw it onto Bitmax or Bit or whatever it was and sold four hundred bitcoins for twenty six million dollars. Mm. And 400. it flat. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And no, it, it was more than that, bro. All the way down to eight oh, yeah, thousand. What's that? No, you're right. You're right. That's what yeah. It and it flash crashed all the way down to eight thousand on Bitmax. Obviously, it freaking just you know spiked up, and then all those buys of people. I mean, think about if you were just had a you just had an old buy, you know, sitting there. Oh, it's gonna go down to freaking ten k, and then boom, you just got freaking set. You just picked it. Four hundred bitcoins, like. I know. Well, that's what I'm yeah. saying is somebody sold off their coin and they did a market sell because they didn't. It was a, a fat finger thing. They forgot to put one extra zero. No, 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 no. That's no, not no, what no. happened. No, it wasn't a fat finger thing. It was a, it was a market sell. Yeah. And what it did is that it, it there was so you know to pull out 26 mil because the order book didn't have the type of liquidity that need, was needed to market sell into the Met, Met, Bitmex mar, uh, market. So it it had to go. It just it was a scam wick, basically. <laughs> it had to all pick up. I bet you that guy. I bet you that guy was putting to go and sell his Bitcoin at a hundred thousand dollars, not ten thousand dollars. And he no, I think he market sold, dude. Well, I think, I, know, I, think, I think he was setting trying to set a limit order, and he did a market sell. That's oh, my yeah. theory. I mean, we could call I mean, the guy. He's probably you know standing on the side of a bridge, like thinking about suicide. But um, I don't probably... know, dude. He just walked away with 26 mil, dude. He probably bought the yeah. dip. At, yeah, so here, we'll bring up the what... screen. We'll bring up the screen. So, okay. so I don't have it. I don't have the million business. dollars for 400 bitcoins, dude. Like, that's not a deal. <laughs> You're not stoked yeah, on But that. if you had, if you have 30,000, you know, you have 3,000 bitcoins, like 400 ain't, you know, whatever. Take the 26 mil yeah. and have a nice day. Well, let's go I mean, interview the guy on the next podcast. And yeah, so anyways, but. Podcast. But we haven't come on this chart. We haven't come down. So where we where we were was at the seventy three ish, which was a euphoric high. Right. I mean, yeah. if everyone sold everything they had on our last, know. you know, pod, then and bought it all back like today, then you would you would have increased your Actually, positions by like twenty to thirty percent. So, but it did I come sold down. A bunch, actually. I was selling like I was I sold a lot of my uh, a, a lot of my altcoins and I picked up and I, so I did increase my positions. So when it goes back up, it's going to be a nice little bump. Yeah. 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 I got a couple nice buys too. Um, or I, I was selling and I missed some, you know, some things continued to go up, which was a bit frustrating. But I Solana, I can't believe Solana. I, I, I sold and then I bought and it just kept going down. So I was like, uh, oh, look, Solana just kept going up during it did come down a little bit. But I mean, it's still hot. It's still been on. Of, that looks just like Bitcoin. Yeah. Still, and then it's still up from my $14 buy. And then here, AVAX kept going up during that whole situation too which was you know last week on the 11th it it ended up pumping up to like 65 dollars went up like another 30 percent but if you look at bitcoin here bitcoin is kind of tipped over and um i like to look at this um EM, ema ribbon right here so you can see it like tipped over on the daily but it ended up get, finding support on the ema ribbon now so it's probably if it was to break below 58,000, right? Yeah. Then it would tip this into a short position and that would be a bearish sign that could definitely bring the price down to this line. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, look, I think Josh is, you know, on the right side of that bet because for it to get down, it, you know, to below this line is I mean, it's right at that it's level. It's unlikely but still, you owe me. It could happen. Because... I think it will happen. Yeah, I think Josh <laughs> potentially did lose his hundred dollar bet because it did scam wick down to eighty five hundred. Send and me a just... hundred dollars in Solana. I'll take it in crypto. And here's the funny thing. So, it's like, packet. that was the bet. Oh yeah, packet. You can send oh, yeah, it to it me. Packet. Packets yeah. on uh on uh on sale yeah, today. So that's messed up, man. Yeah, it's a it's a little bit sad that you lost that bet, Josh. But 
it was it was a crazy it's kind one. of crazy it's though that like we were talking but about look, it but look what happened. It happened it went all the way down there was a like this like crazy wick went down to 8900 so it came it was like all the way down to like right here oh, that's so crazy <laughs> some I mean, guys some guys picked up most such... people like that are gonna watch our this watch this pod aren't gonna quite understand what i'm about to yeah, say yeah, but yeah. here's the here's the thing to just that's crazy so le with leverage trading which we've been experimenting a little bit with leverage trading and what leverage trading basically means is that let's say you have a hundred dollars um, and you want to trade with 10x leverage. Well, what happens is that the exchange will essentially loan you uh, 10x of that 100. So you put up 100 at risk and they'll give you spending power of $1,000. Right. But what that means is that if the price goes up by 1%, then it accelerates your, your gain. So you actually will gain 10% and then you can just cash it out problem is that if the price goes down by 5%, then you actually lose 50% of your collateral. Like you're actually down $50. And if it goes, and if it goes down, you know, and you, you could lose all of if it. If it goes down 10%, which is super possible, 10, 20%, that happens all the time in crypto, then you can get completely liquidated. And if that's it why it's cool to do it with the shit coins, because like the yeah. shibs and the freaking Pepe, because yeah. they so move volatile. such small They're amounts. So volatile. Yeah, yeah, but they move small amounts. So like you could do a 50X and you yeah, have yeah. a little bit more time if you bet like, you know, 100 or do the That's 200 like full gambling. I hate but, futures. But, but here's, yeah, if you, it's really tough with the future stuff. But here's the crazy thing about the scam wick. So let's give you an example. Let's say that you traded with leverage and you bought some Bitcoin at the bottom, right? Which was on the daily chart. Let's, let's look at the, let's actually, let's go to the weekly here. Oh my God. I just thought of something. So check Hold this on. out. Hold on. So let's say you bought, um, let's say you bought, let me turn this EMA ribbon off. Let's say you bought some, um, you bought in like right here, um, at like 16,000, which was the low of this period, right? Of our last, of this last cycle, this was like the low right here was right about 16,000. So if you traded with leverage and then you caught over time this uptrend that you can see on the screen right here where it's like you entered right down here and then and then it went up continuously. It hasn't ever retested this 16. So if you're on leverage, let's say you have 10x leverage and it just kept going up and you put like $1000 in you could be up thousands of percent at this point, all the way up to um, 65,000. And so you just leave your leverage open because you think, hey, it's never going back to 16,000. It's going up to 100. I'm going to make thousands and thousands of percent. Well, this scam wick right here just came down and liquidated every single person. Because like, if you entered at 16,000, your liquidation was probably like 12. But that only happened on that, only happened on on that, that one exchange. exchange. But anybody who had leverage on that exchange. everybody if they every did leverage person every single person who had leverage on on bitmex got liquidated off of this scam wick that came down yeah so like that exchange well that's so what i was thinking money. that's what i was thinking like maybe that person had a crazy short position leverage on bitcoin made that sell and then picked up that liquidation freaking crazy liquidation on the sell and just <laughs> freaking stacked it but you had had to close out quick because it it was quick. It was like a one yeah. minute candle. Yeah, yeah one yeah, minute yeah. probably it was seconds. Yeah. Uh, anyway, dope. All right, well, well boys, it's been uh, been lovely chatting. Yes, it was. Very and, nice. Uh, See you guys, and yeah, well, uh, thanks to everybody if you've made it this far for listening <laughs> to our uh, our little spiel here for the last hour and a half. But uh, yeah. yeah, we're gonna keep doing this every week, and um, it's nice to see more people uh, listening and. Yeah, uh, jump it in. Make sure you uh, like and subscribe. Keep the yeah. game alive. Yeah, thanks, guys. All right, we'll see you next week. All right, All right. cheers. All right, boys.